Good day, friends. Welcome to another Word of Gord. Average folks in the afterlife number uh, 68, if I'm not mistaken. And then I could well be mistaken because I'm a faulted creature. I come uh, preloaded with uh, errors, mistakes, and faux pas. <clears throat> Um, as I hinted in the last one, thought we might go into some near-death experience uh, stuff. And uh, I've decided to go with that. Decisive creature that I am. And uh, passage, A Passage to Eternity by Asmina Suleiman. Not very well-known book, um, but certainly uh, quite a profound one. And uh, goes into quite a bit of detail about her experience. Um, a medical emergency on whilst on holiday, I believe, which uh, turned into an extended, uh, um, how shall we say, tour of um, many levels. And I might compare it later to Eben Alexander's uh, bestseller from a year or two ago. Because they're quite, quite different. Abens is uh, short and to the point, And this one is uh, detailed beyond uh, most uh, encounters that I have uh, come across. So detailed, well, you know, a couple of hundred pages. Um, I'm just going to be doing the selected highlights here. Else will be, I'll be reading it for weeks. Um, so I'm going to go right... Not quite into the middle, but certainly um, a few pages in for sure. <clears throat> I now knew that the mysterious allure of light on the hospital roof in Orlando, that's where she had her NDE, of course, had been my unmistakable clarion call of death. One that I had not recognized before, but certainly did now. Yet, for some strange reason, I got the distinct impression that I was being summoned to the great beyond for some definite purpose, as opposed to merely for a respite and a much-needed rest from the toil of earthly existence. As all these thoughts flooded my mind, I began to get a genuine feel for some of the hidden dynamics at play in my life. And as I let my mind momentarily disengage from the scene below, I found myself being veered off to the right in a powerful sweeping motion by an invisible force that I felt powerless to resist. In the next instant, I found myself stationed in front of a huge translucent structure resembling a giant dome that seemed to be sculpted out of marble or some kind of white luminous material. Even though I could clearly see right through its walls, I could not hear what was being bandied about inside. <laughs> I like her use of the word bandied. More precisely, I did not yet seem to have the ability to tune into the higher telepathic thought waves of the occupants inside. As I waited outside the dome, I felt totally cut off from the pulse of human existence that I had just left behind. Nor did I feel that I rightly belonged to the glimmering world of shadowless reality in front of me. My sense of disconnection and non-belonging could have not been more complete. I felt totally and utterly isolated from all human as well as spiritual contact at this point. It was, without a doubt, the loneliest moment of my existence and the darkest night of my soul. Well, that's, uh, those are strong words. Even though by now I knew I was dead to the world in a physical sense, what I was presently experiencing did not exactly feel like heaven, nor did it feel quite like hell. It felt like I was in a state of limbo, suspended as I was between heaven and earth. Even as I agonized over my plight, I seemed to have sudden flash of recognition and understanding. I realized that heaven was not one homogeneous mass of existence, but a multidimensional plane of layered existences. And I further realized that between each stratified level of reality existed a thin veil or void that served to separate one reality from the next. Um, yes to the multidimensionality of it, uh, many planes, many subplanes. 
the veil is um, a sort of a personal perception. Everyone out there seems to get a sense that there are levels and uh, that uh, there are boundaries between those levels. But be how they perceive those boundaries is, is pretty, you know, personal. And a veil is one way of expressing that personal perception. Thus, I realized that this immense vacuum of nothingness in which I seemed to find myself was actually, in fact, some kind of transitional zone that existed between two dimensions. Even the softly lit tunnel that I emerged out of with its encroaching darkness was technically a veil or a void that had separated the physical third dimensional world of matter from the fourth dimensional world of spirit. In fact, it struck me that those who did not make it out of the tunnel into the light, but had instead lingered in its veiled darkness, were the ones who experienced the virtual torment and miserable, sorry, misery traditionally associated with hell. As fire and brimstone and a wrathful god bent on vengeance had never been part of my system of beliefs, and since I tended to believe more in the inherent good light and goodness of God, I was thankfully spared the tortures of hell. But I was nevertheless acutely conscious of the fact that hell was definitely a state of mind that existed for many. It existed only for those individuals who did not believe in a power higher than themselves, nor felt themselves personally accountable to anyone for their actions. Consequently, they did as they pleased without regard to consequences and allowed their passions to dominate over their lives. Well, yes, hell certainly is a belief system, but um, so is everything else. Heavens, paradises, purgatories. They're all belief systems. <clears throat> Never realized one of them. Now, some are definitely more pleasant than others. No question there. Although I was not in a hell per se, it was still a bit of an anticlimax to find myself trapped in this vast emptiness of space in no man's land. Being in a veil or void was like being in transit, and I realized that it, had, it too had definite place in God's scheme of things. It helped to bridge that gap between dimensions and film, familiarize me with the next dimension. One of the first things that I noticed was the primary consciousness of the preceding dimension still has the power to affect you in the void, even though you are no longer part of that dimension. In other words, my ethereal double, or this light and airy part of me floating around aimlessly in space, still had the ability to feel the pull of earthly existence that I had freshly left behind. So even though I no longer possessed a physical body to speak of, I could still feel the gnawing sensations of hunger, thirst, cold, and fatigue. Interesting. In fact, I was beginning to feel decidedly weak and irritable by now, as the stress associated with being in a physical body continued to maintain its hold on me in this particular zone. And I intuitively recognized that until such time as I had clearly crossed over, it was something that I would somehow have to endure with dignity and grace. Well, yes, there's a lot we have to endure with dignity and grace, isn't there? Even this vacuum of nothingness that I found myself in was beginning to visibly darken in response to my dismal mood. <clears throat> I suddenly felt chilled to the bone as I felt myself overcome by this overwhelming sense of weariness. I, in looking back, I realized that the half, last half dozen or so years of my life on earth had been physically, mentally and emotionally draining. All I wanted to do now was close my eyes and drift off into that long, blissful sleep of forgetfulness. Well, I think a lot of us <laughs> feel that every night as we drift off to sleep, don't we? Or some version of it. I knew that a round of well-earned celestial rest was something that all returning souls like myself could at least look forward to. But for the time being, I remembered thinking to myself that I would gladly settle for a warm blanket, as well as, as, well as something more solid than a cloud to sit on to rest my weary self. Seeing another human face wouldn't hurt either, I had thought to myself. Amazingly, even before I had finished fantasizing about these creature comforts of home, I found myself being bundled up in a warm blanket and being wheeled around in a wheelchair by someone that I actually recognized. See? Thoughts manifest. 
It was Parvin, the same friend who I'd half jokingly bid to look me up in heaven if I ever happened to be on my deathbed, only days before I left for Florida. Strangely enough, I had found myself at death's door literally five days after uttering those fateful words. <clears throat> As I tried to recollect my thoughts, it occurred to me that experiencing this fascinating paranormal stuff was actually not that unusual. After all, I was halfway into the spirit world and in a realm where one's thoughts tended to manifest instantly. What I had witnessed was in fact the norm and primarily the way that life was projected on the higher dimensions of reality. The way that life was projected. Good point. It struck me that whatever we experience on our physical third dimensional earth is mainly recorded and channeled through our limited senses, namely through what we feel, touch, see, smell, hear, or taste. In the higher dimensions, however, where we actually transcend the barriers of time and space, a whole new set of extrasensory perceptions, perceptions kick in and we begin to experience reality more directly. For example, when we communicate, we communicate directly and telepathically. Also, we can see into all segments of time and are able to envisage events from our past, present and future without as much as opening our physical eyes. Whatever we think or feel is thus experienced immediately on the higher dimensions of existence. Everything seems instantaneous as the concept of time itself is virtually non-existent. In fact, time, I realized, is something that is created specifically for our environment on Earth by slowing down the vibration of our thoughts. This slowing down process allows us to, in effect, freeze frame time, which in turn helps us to organize and chronologically compartmentalize our thoughts into distinct and separate time slots. Therefore, it is this very separation and slowing down of events that gives us the illusion of time, of experiencing a distinct past, present and future, when, in reality, all time is really a single, integrated sequence of events on the higher planes of reality. In other words, our present, our past, and our future coexist side by side in one continuous spool of eternity. Due to the slowing down process of time on Earth, the inherent unity of the time and space continuum often seems stretched out, disconnected, or at odds with each other. As a result, there's always a time lag to contend with on Earth before a desired thought can manifest itself as a tangible reality. Moreover, if the necessary time, effort, and attention required to sustain a particular thought is not intense enough, the thought soon fizzles out and never actually materializes. Therefore, along with the desired thought, there also needs to be sustained effort to make that thought a viable reality. Um, good point. And um, something I often say in discussions about the, uh, this modern uh, fascination with manifestation. People talking about it. Teachers talking about how to manifest. People practicing it, going to weekend seminars and coming away a month later thinking nothing really worked for them and then trying to sue the people that taught them. And there's been a whole pile of stuff on that the last few years. And I always say to people, well, you know, you have to sustain the thought. And also you have to uh, work on the, uh, the doubts that come along with the thoughts because um, we project our doubts into the thought world as much as we do our desires. Lack of worthiness, all that sort of thing. So, um, good point there, uh, Asmina. So, um, therefore, there is no time lag to contend with, and as such, there is no real effort required to crystallize a particular thought, because here, everything happens instantaneously. Consequently, everything appears effortless in the spirit world and life seems relatively easy and uncomplicated compared to our struggling existence. True. And that's one reason why we come here, because uh, manifesting is so easy in spirit and it's much more of a challenge here. 
The fourth dimension is also the plane that more closely resembles life on Earth, but without the pain, sorrow, and heartache. Thus, it is very, this very aspect of life without pain or struggle in the fourth dimension that gives rise to our conventional notions of paradise, namely that the land of milk and honey and life of indolent luxury. True, true, true. It's um, not a place on the physical plane. It's not a place in history. It's not a mythical land uh, somewhere in a mountain uh, valley. It's um, paradise before we were born. Um, basically, that's it. Although, sorry, therefore, the fourth dimension in reality is a plane of created thought forms, one that instantly molds itself to the thoughts that you entertain in your mind. It projects whatever it is that you desire to be projected and becomes an instant manifested reality for you and no one else. Unless, of course, that other person actively chooses to participate in your version of reality. Um, I remember uh, a channel communication years ago from an alien entity who said um, something about, let me into your dream and I will let you into my dream and we will dream together. And I thought, hmm, very good. And I still do. Thus, for better or worse, the fourth dimension is essentially a plane of illusion, just like a sorcerer's trick or hypnotic suggestion that exists strictly in the eye, the mind of the beholder. So I tried to gather my bearings in the spirit world. I reckoned that since I had clearly emerged out of the tunnel and into the light, I must be now in the next veil. I figured that I had to be in the veil that separated the illusory fourth dimension from the higher fifth. Um, it seems to me that um, she had a belief system about dimensions before she had her NDE. So she keeps talking about them and talking about them confidently. I felt It felt like I was caught up in some kind of time warp or halfway house in heaven where the view from below was dramatically different from the view above. As I looked below me to the left, I could see several groups of self-absorbed individuals completely wrapped up in their fourth dimensional world of created thought forms. They seem totally oblivious of my existence or the existence of a higher realm of reality other than their own. They were caught up in their own little world and heaven of their own making, stuck in their rigid, religion, sorry, rigid beliefs of reality and quite unaware of the greater reality existing outside their own little spheres of existence. I call that the village consciousness. You see it in villages all around the world, even now with the internet and all the rest of it. People are really caught up in um, what their neighbors are doing and what's on, you know, on sale at the store this week and uh, whether they'll go to the pub for a beer that night. And, and it form, all neighborhoods are like little villages. And, you know, it extends the notion of a village, the traditional notion. And it's very similar to uh, the consciousness of various little groups on the astral plane. That uh, village consciousness is, uh, transcends um, levels, I find. From my existence, sir, from my perspective, they were merely spinning their wheels as they chased incessantly after their illusions of fame, power, grandeur, and glory, and the utopian ideals of their self-made paradise. So even though I could see clearly the people amidst their self-created fantasies, they could not see me. But as I turned my gaze immediately upwards, I found myself again facing the imposing marble structure that looked like a bubble dome. I should mention this notion of looking down and seeing a, a dimension below you or a level below you. Uh, this is often repeated in uh, channeled communications and uh, automatic writing going back 100, 200 years. Um, other people will also talk about going to a certain place where, because on the astral plane, you don't see the stars and the planets. It's, they're on a different level. They're on our level. They're not on the... Uh, physical planets, they're not on that level. But there are places where you can go where there's a portal where you can see out into the solar system and, you know, traverse there by, on your mental body if you wish. But on the average, uh, <laughs> average, you know, uh, heavenly realm of dead people, you know, living through their uh, um, c collective, 
you know, thought form of what their heaven world should be and is, there's no looking at the, uh, the stars and planets like we do at night. Anyway, that's another story. But, uh, oh yes, the, the, the bubble dome. I could vaguely make out what was going on inside at this point. A full session meeting in an informal courtroom setting seemed to be in progress. Although I could not quite grasp or comprehend what was going on inside, I felt a sudden trepidation that I had not felt before. I intuitively knew that what, end, what went on behind those closed but transparent doors would have the very real power to direct my destiny for the remainder of eternity. Ooh, that's, that's strong. A meeting that determines the rest of your uh, time in eternity? Ooh. I'd suspect there's more than one meeting. But, you know, that's not my experience. That's hers. Whether or not they were aware of my trembling presence outside, I could not tell. But I felt totally shut out from the mainstream of human as well as spiritual existence. It was as though I'd somehow managed to sneak into heaven through the back door and there was nobody home to so much as acknowledge my existence. Yet, I knew I existed not because I could plainly see and feel this ethereal vision of myself, but because I was fully conscious. And as long as I thought, I knew I existed, and as such was living proof that human consciousness indeed survived bodily death. As I sat there waiting for the other shoe to drop, it somehow ran through my mind that a meeting with the powers that be, which certainly seemed imminent, normally took place at the entrance of the fifth dimension. I also recognized that as the forum in which my life would be closely examined and scrutinized, the outcome of which would effectively seal or determine my fate. That's pretty heavy. The, you know, the, we're going to go to the Council of Elders thing here. I can see it. And, um, but this notion that they're going to determine what you, you know, do in the next six incarnations and uh, you know, your, your general direction and spiritual uh, um, <laughs> ambitions that's a little heavy. After what seemed like an eternity, I was finally <laughs> summoned into the transparent dome. God, it's just like going for a job interview. The setup inside looked strangely familiar. I recognized it as the place where the Council of Elders ordinarily presided over the evaluation of one's life. That's another thing. You don't see a Council of Elders unless you really think you need one. Um, other people have reported sitting down with friends and joking around. Um people that souls that you recognize as friends and some people talk about just chanting with the spirit guide for a while who sort of <laughs> takes out his file folder and goes well uh not too bad this time uh not so much avarice and greed uh way less ruthless ambition uh much more compassion for the needy not too not too bad you know something like that anyway uh and usually meetings like that wind up in laughter because the guy the the guy the girl the person that's doing them has been in and out of incarnation themselves and recognize all the traps that you either fell into or you know climbed out of rather quickly because let's face it you can fall into those negative thought traps but if you catch yourself fast you can like scrabble up the ladder and get out before it's too late you know it's just a lot of young souls get in it and go Hey, I like this being ruthless and greedy stuff. Yeah, power over everyone else. I can dig it. You know, they, they fall right into it and think, all that stuff about retribution and, oh, no, nah, that's all nonsense. Yeah, well, they'll find out later. Um, I recognize it as the place where the Council of Elders ordinarily presided over the evaluations of one life. But somehow I got the distinction, the distinct impression that I was being summoned before this august committee. Not only for a review and assessment of my life, but for some other reason I couldn't fathom. I was also acutely aware that being accorded an audience with the Council of Elders at this particular stage in the phase called death was more a matter of privilege than of course. Despite finding myself in the company of other beings, I felt terribly alone. I felt like a silent observer in the courtroom. Even though I didn't take an active part in the discussions, I knew that I was the reason for being there. Seated directly in front of me in a raised dais were three serious-looking individuals in what appeared to be their 70s, two men and a woman. Each seemed to have a balanced kind of composure that was nearly distinctly feminine nor masculine, 
and each exuded an air of compassion and authority. Um, also some kind of wisdom that simply shone. The woman who was seated in the middle appeared to be the chair and the one guiding the proceedings. Oh, that's good for a post-feminist world that we live in. The woman's in charge. I mean, uh, of course, maybe they set that up for her, you know. If you're, um, if you, you know, you die when you're a teenager, maybe they'll, uh, you know, give you somebody that looks like a, you know, a music star who's only 21, or, you know. Um, some Madonna lookalike, you know. Oh, no, she's not 21 anymore. The grey of her hair seemed to match her robe and was loosely piled into a knot at the back of her head. Of the three, I somehow felt a sense of instant kinship and rapport with her and uh, basically emotionally comforted by her presence. The bonds of affection that bind us to each other on earth, I discovered, carry over across space and time into eternity. Even as I made this realization, I caught a glimpse of a younger version of my dad, who had passed away some 27 years ago. He appeared to be putting forward a proposal to the panel of elders and seemed to be negotiating with them on my behalf. As though to make his point, it appeared that he had taken the liberty of calling upon someone that I knew and instantly recognized. It was none other than Uncle Val, Valentin Hogarth Milvain, the former Chief Justice of the Trial Division of Alberta, whose biography I had just recently published. Of course, that's mentioned uh, earlier on in, uh, in the book before she went on holiday. She just finished her biography of this uh, Chief Justice, who, um, for those of you who are not Canadians, Alberta is a province of Canada. And like many uh, people who live in the Plains provinces, they love to go south to places like Florida in the winter, and as did she, because it's really cold up there in the winter. Seeing a hologram of my father in his early 40s, attired in his familiar grey pants and white open neck shirt, did not seem all that surprising, but the sight of a vibrant Uncle Val in his black judge's gown with a bright red trim completely blew me away. He was the last person I would have expected to see, for after all, I didn't have a real blood connection with him like the one I had with my father. However, for some reason, all my former insecurities about my current condition seemed to be suddenly melting away at the sight of these two individuals, with whom I had shared such great affection and kinship. And it was for the first time since being awakened to the sobering truth of my death that I felt truly at peace with myself. As I sat there dreamingly oblivious of the proceedings before me, I was suddenly jerked out of my reverie by one of the elders seated in front of me. He seemed to be holding out to me a legal-looking document and explaining, though not the medium of words, but telepathically, that it was my life contract that had essentially granted me a new leaf on, lease on life. It also meant that I had their seal of approval to proceed farther. But my new lease on life, I discovered, came with strings attached and was contingent upon certain conditions. <laughs> the main stipulation was that if I chose to return to the physical life at this point, then it would require my carrying out a special mission. The nature of the mission, however, was something that would be impressed directly on my mind and revealed to me at the appropriate time. <laughs> This to my mind looked more like a plea, guard, plea bargaining session than a typical forum for reviewing my life. Also, for some inscrutable reason, it appeared that I was actually being afforded a choice in the matter of life and death itself. In fact, it struck me that I was being given a few choices from which to make an appropriate selection. Even as I tried to grasp their significance, one or two of those life choices were projected directly before me in brief but tantalizing detail. One selection in particular seemed to stand out vividly in my mind. I remember seeing myself as a boy of about 10 or 11 flying a kite and living a life of privilege in what appeared to be a suburb of Montreal. However, the option that held the greatest attraction was coming back as myself, but with a slightly different focus. I realized that for better or worse, coming back as the devil I knew seemed infinitely more appealing than the devil I didn't. <laughs> Coming back as myself, however, seemed to have its own downside. It meant a quick turnaround and an immediate return to physical life. It also meant necessarily waiving that customary period of rest and reflection in the spirit world and being faced with what must most likely be a long and arduous road to recovery. 
However, by this time I was so weary that I was past caring whether or not I ever returned to the physical world. I felt completely and utterly exhausted and by now had more or less resigned myself to death. In fact, death seemed to be the more attractive alternative at this time and it, as it represented a definite respite from those often harsh and incessant struggles. All I wanted to do was go away to some quiet place and rest my worn and battered self. Even as I reflected upon how physically and emotionally draining life on earth had been, I found myself being guided into a quiet and secluded spot. It appeared to be in a closely wooded area that was brimming with the unspoiled beauty of luxuriant undergrowth and ferns. And discreetly tucked away into the landscape was a gently cascading waterfall that simply took my breath away. The water sparkled like crystal. Each seemed alive and vibrant on a f and full of an indefinable energy that seemed to virtually leap out of me. All my senses tingled in anticipation and wonder at having recounted, encountered such exquisite beauty. The next thing I knew, I would find myself under that luminous spray of water that washed me over like the gently falling rain of an April shower. It felt like the soft caress of a dewdrop, almost like fairy dust that glittered and sparkled and seemed to melt upon contact. I could feel its vital energy being drawn and absorbed into every ounce of my being as it cleansed and purified the very essence of who I was. These um, life renewing, energy renewing waterfalls that, that, that are around in the spirit world, there's quite a few of them. It can't, everybody can't be going to the same one, that's for sure, because you read about it a lot and heck, I've done it myself. <laughs> they are quite marvelous though, oh yes. Mm -mm. Like your average shower times a hundred, you know. It was pure exhilaration under the sparkling waterfall. I felt myself respond with every nerve and fibre of my being as I felt cleansed of all my cares and worries. Up until now, it was though I'd been walking around in the trance like some kind of zombie, and I felt suddenly alive and vibrant, inexplicably transformed and full of a renewed vigour and sense of vitality. This was perhaps the closest I had come to experiencing heaven. I do not know how long I remained in my newfound uh, haven and sanctuary of peace, but I could have stayed there forever if I did. Uh, I could have stayed there forever, basically. I discovered that there's no such thing as forever, at least not in this particular part of heaven. Not until we make it back to the source of all creation and become one with God. Ooh. And can we experience the absolute oneness and unity of time that we call eternity? Until then, I realized there would always be some measure of time and space to contend with, even if only in a relative sense. Although I realized that the choice of whether or not to go back into physical life was mine and mine alone, I somehow had the feeling that I was being emotionally manipulated into making that right choice. And just like the way I had seen it in my precognitive dream only a few months before, I found myself standing on what looked like the edge of a cloud and looking down over the top of a curved surface. As I directed my gaze downwards past the layers of foamy looking clouds, I could see what life was like for my family back on earth as they tried to deal with the uncertainty and trauma of my impending death. I could see my son Shafin, who was 10 at the time, curled up in a fetal position and fast asleep on the chair at the Celebration Hospital in Orlando. He seemed firmly convinced in his mind that I was having a baby and had wondered what all the commotion was about. But the, two older, the, the older of the two boys, Rahim, age 12, was more acutely aware of the true situation and I could see him desperately fight back the tears and hide the anguish in his heart. I could also see the distraught figure of my husband standing over my comatose body, fervently praying and pleading for me not to leave him and the boys just yet. Emotions I discovered are felt much more deeply and intensely in the spirit world than is humanly conceivable on earth. In a place where you can no longer feel physical pain, Emotional pain, the kind that literally sears your soul, more than makes up for that lack. Thus, the pain of seeing my husband and children in such a state of torment tugged heavily at my heartstrings and tore excruciatingly into my soul. My heart went out to them. And then I knew exactly what it was I had to do. Although initially I had mixed feelings about accepting the enormity of some mission that I did not even comprehend, I didn't anymore. I also knew that whether or not I successfully came out of my coma or comatose state would depend entirely on the decision I made. 
I knew then with absolute certainty in my heart what path I had to take. I knew I had to return to my family. I no longer felt tired or lethargic, but totally reinvigorated and at the top of my game. I cannot remember ever feeling this alert and focused or being able to think with such precision and clarity. Even as I became absolutely clear in my mind as to what exactly I wanted to do of my own will and volition, I found myself in an enclosed space that reminded me of a planetarium. The dome ceiling and sides resembled the continuous converging screen of an omniplex theatre. Amazingly, projected in front of me all and all around me was the panoramic viewing of my entire life to date. Both the highs and lows of my life were flashed before me at monumental speed. Yet, I seemed to be able to control the very speed at which I viewed my life, merely by focusing and concentrating my thought. I could slow down any given event in my life and literally step into it, even though I w it was something that had taken place several years before. For some reason, I remembered slowing down and zooming into the time when I was just a seven or eight year old, eight month old baby. I saw how even as a baby, I'd managed to touch a certain individual, a close friend of my father's, who had held a special place in his heart for me. Every time he saw me, he seemed to visibly light up, something that I too had joyously and wholeheartedly responded to as a baby. This demonstrated to me how, even as babies, we are capable of bringing immense joy, happiness and hope to others without consciously being aware of it. It also showed me how such love given out unconditionally as a way of kindling and warming up even the most hardened heart. Pure love, I discovered, has a way of sparking off a connection at the deepest and innermost levels of ourselves. One that is essentially spirit. Rather than dwelling upon the events themselves, what seemed to be more important was the net outcome of the events, namely how my particular actions in life had affected others around me. Consequently, I was able to gain valuable insight into how others perceived me, something that I had not been fully aware of before. It was like viewing my entire life from several angles at once and from a wider than usual perspective. And I was surprised to discover that what I considered relatively insignificant or trivial often had more profound and far-reaching effect on my life than something I thought important. I also realized that I had learned much more from my failures than the apparent successes. My life review seemed over in a flash. Not a detail was missed as I saw the truth behind every event in my life in a way that I would never have dreamt possible. Interestingly, though, it was not a matter of anyone else judging the contents of my life, but more a matter of my examining my own life and judging myself. Accordingly, I discovered that not only was I the sole judge and arbiter of my life, but I was also my own harshest critic. And wherever my conscience pricked the most, that was the area in which my life had had the greatest scope for improvement. Well, that's all pretty true, I'd say. And it's certainly um, corroborated by uh, other ND years uh, who um, seem to come up over and over again with this notion that you are your own harshest critic and that guides and um, people that you might think might judge you don't. They just kind of go over your file and mention this and mention that and sort of give you the look. And then, of course, the look, you know, sort of, you know, oh, yeah, I, OK, I get it. <clears throat> so um, much more in this to uh, get to. It's a very interesting NDE. It's, as I say, more detailed than most. And um, we'll get to more very soon. And uh, especially if I ever get up out of this comfortable chair, <clears throat> which is you know, quite a challenge. So until next time, friends, don't judge yourself too harshly.